Hi folks, today's video I'm going to be doing about Home Assistant and it's an open source and self-hosted home automation system but central to it really is privacy and local control and what that can mean for you is that whether the internet goes down, whether the cloud provider goes out of business in a year's time or whether that cloud provider has been hacked, your house remains up and running with all its monitoring and installation. So it's quite an interesting thing, I think, for many to consider. And apart from that, you're also not really held hostage to any particular cloud provider. Now, this is one tool that can manage lots of different applications, systems, and devices. And if you think that with most things that you buy, whether it's some smart switches or it's a solar system or, you know, phone, whatever the case is, each one comes with its own app. And why do you want to have 13, 15, 17 different applications on your phone to, to do this one thing than to do another thing? What about sort of centralizing it all and automating it and getting it all to work together in one tool? And that really is what Home Assistant is offering you. It monitors and manages tons of different devices around the home. In fact, it's over 1,900 uh, integrations that it's got with different devices and services. But it'll work around a home or a workplace with things like automation to notify you by various different means or to control those devices through automation itself. And as I was just alluding to, it's not just about smart switches and lights. That's often what people sort of see, but it's a lot more than that. I mean, it can be garage doors, solar installations, uh, location of devices or that are moving or changing states and that sort of thing. The central power really around it lies actually in the automations. It's one thing just to monitor and see something and see what a battery or a device is doing. But think about this. Say, for example, it just starts to rain. This system could detect the start of the rainfall for you and then notify you via, say, Google speakers or something else. It's raining outside. Go take the washing off the line. Or if you, for example, are leaving the shopping center or work or wherever, it can send a notification to your spouse whether it's a text or a voice or whatever the case is, to say, hey, you know what, someone's just left work on his way home now. Then you've also got things like, say, weather forecast change. So if tomorrow is going to be raining, maybe you want to adjust the minimum state of charge for your battery on your solar system. It's all that and tons, tons more that you can actually do. So it can be actually as simple or as in-depth as you want to go with the system. And in fact, I've spent probably the last four days, five days solidly just building up and doing some really exciting things, or for me anyway, and I'll show you some of that. And I think the thing with Home Assistant is I've started with it, but there's actually so much more that I'm going to be doing, and it's going to you know, be refined, I suppose, over the next couple of months. And if the Various devices, the 1900 plus that have integrations, if those aren't enough, it can still communicate also through protocols like MQTT or Modbus, amongst others, to then communicate with devices that have that type of communication built in, even without any integrations. And I'll show you an example of that as well. So as I said, it can really be just pure GUI interface. You can just work purely with what's in, what provides integrations and a couple of drop-down menus and, and set those for yourself. Or you can dig really deep and spend time you know, evolving the code, defining different icons and colors and responses and various things. There's basically no end in sight, really. So many people will often have installed this on a Raspberry Pi, which is fine. That seems to be the default for, for many people, and it's nice and cheap. I just ran out of a Raspberry Pis. I don't have enough to run all the different things I want to run. So I have done a video before about hosting at home, and I will put a link to it below and, and above top right for this video. But I've now actually installed this on a, in a container, Docker container actually, on my server at home. It's just a more efficient way of running lots of different services. And it runs perfectly well in Docker container. The only thing that's different possibly or that you'll notice really, it doesn't have the supervisor dashboard and any services that you want to spin up like MQTT or something like that. With the Raspberry Pi, you can actually have one or two clicks and it runs that service for you within the same instance. With the containerized and Docker version, it just means you've just got to spin up another container with say an MQ, MQTT broker in or whatever the one or two additional services are that you might need. 
But so far, that's all I've had to run in addition. Otherwise, apart from that, I'm running really just the plain thing in the Docker container. And what I'm going to cover now in this video will be just some basic terminology, one pager on that, just to be sort of familiar with what entities and so on are as far as Home Assistant is. I will going to give a little tour around my dashboard to show you what I've done so far. And then I'm going to drill down just into one or two entities just to show you sort of what entities and attributes look like. I'll show some integrations as well that are both built into Home Assistant as well as the Home Assistant Community Store. That'll be a valuable part if you haven't used Home Assistant. Maybe look at that part of the video as well because it may trigger some interest actually looking at and identifying with many of the devices you've possibly already got in your home or services, you know, whether it's Spotify, anything like that. And then I'm going to just speak specifically around the Modbus interface with a Victron solar system. I spent quite a bit of time getting it to communicate and work with my solar system. And that may be of interest, especially to other Victron users. But otherwise, even if you just want to use the Modbus type interface or communication protocol, that will be of interest as well. And then I will just lastly look at the GitHub page that I've created where I'm actually sharing the config files that I've put together. So if anybody wants to look at or make use of, you know, how I format it and, and syntax that and so on, that uh, will be a repository for you to go and consult with as well. I'll also there also just link to various of the other resources that I've actually made use of. And then we'll wrap up. Hopefully it's not going to be too long. So I think let's just start off then with the terminology. This is just sort of a high level how it interfaces with things. It's got what they call integrations. And the integrations is just purely a software API really. So say it's something that integrates with Spotify or it integrates with a weather station or it interfaces with an iPhone. There'll be a software API for that. So there'll be an integration called you know, iPhone, ambient weather, or, or whatever the case is. That, that's what integration really is. And that's sort of the highest level that you'll, you'll see. As I've said there, that integration generally then interfaces with some or other device or a service, a service being like Spotify or some other online thing, and a device being usually a hardware, whether it's an iPhone, a weather station, a Sonoff, Wi-Fi switch, something like that. That'll be a device. And in turn, each device has got a number of entities. It's things like a battery level, a temperature, a switch, that type of thing. And another important concept around entities, and it defines its behavior really, is what type of an entity is it? Is it a binary thing, like an on-off thing, a switch, whatever? Is it a light that's possibly got brightness and levels or color, that sort of thing? Is it a sensor? Sensors something that measures something. So whether it'll be temperature, vibration, um, battery levels, whatever the case, that'll be a sensor. A tracker will normally be something that relates to lo location, geolocation. In other words, is it here? Is it outside? Is it left something? Is it entering something? That sort of thing. And you'll get things like cameras that have got video feeds. There's also media devices and various others, just as an example, really. And then for each entity, it also has got a particular state or value. So say for a battery level, it'll have something like a percent, a battery level percentage, 75, 72, you know, as it's um, going down. Temperature is going to have typically a state like a temperature, 32 degrees Celsius or whatever the case is. And bear in mind, these are quite important, obviously, the units of measure. And then a switch is also going to have a state like on or off. So you can both turn a switch on or off and control it, but you can also read its state. In other words, if the switch is on and the temperature is, or the weather is cloudy, or the weather is rainy, then, and you can you know, do things through automation with it. And then another aspect there really is the attributes. So each one of these states, uh, things like a, a battery percentage, for example, it'll have something like a unit of measure. Uh, it's a percentage or is it a degree Celsius or, you know, is it a millimeter? Is it yards? Whatever the case is, it's got something like a unit of measure. Other attributes are going to be things like a device class for temperature, maybe relating to things like temperature. Another one that are common to all of them usually is something like an icon. And you can define things like material design icons here, MDI with whatever the name of the icon is. But that's an important thing again that you can change. So for example, if it's in an on state, you're going to use a particular icon. If it's in an off state, it'll display a different icon. 
but you can get quite creative and imaginative around that. But that's really in a nutshell, sort of some of the high level how it interfaces. And then what I want to move on to next is let's just look around the dashboard. It'll give you a better sort of view of what I'm talking about, I think, really. What you'll see here is there's a couple of different dashboards or views that I've got up at the top here. So the one I've got is the landing view, which is home. And this is typically the one that my wife uses most. Well, I'm trying to get her to use it. So the, the sort of things that I've got on these are gauges that you're seeing here. And there's graphs, there's maps, there's media devices, and so on. So typically what I've got, some of the things that are here is I've got a sensor that is connected around the mains power lead in my distribution, electrical distribution box. And that is an effigy sensor. And you'll see there is an integration for, for effigy. And amongst other things, it can, from the effigy service, it's reading things like cost, amount of power, uh, cost today, cost yesterday, cost for the month. And this is just one of those entities that I'm reading there. And this is the currency value of the grid electricity that I'm actually used to date this month. There's another one here, which you see here as well as here are ring doorbell integrations. This one is just reading the battery level and I've defined some colors as well to show when it's going yellow, when it's going red. The ring doorbell really works, you see it's an idle state, it really works on when something moves or it replays every now and again you'll see. So that was the last activity that happened on the doorbell. This just shows really the state of sunrise, how much sun we've got for the day, that sort of thing. Cape Town, very important to know load shedding. So there is an integration I see for city of Cape Town specifically is load shedding. It tells you if we are load shedding at the moment, when the next stage is and so on. I've still got to finish some of this actually. Other things are just things like weather forecast. Obviously that connects to a weather service and there's a number of them. This one over here, our weather station, is actually connected to my ambient weather station. So this is literally reading from the sensors of my weather station, what the outside temperature feels like and what the inside home temperature actually is at the moment. I've also got a Reolink Wi-Fi IP camera and this can also detect things like motion and certain other things that you can then set up automation for. But at the moment, I've just got it set up. We're watching the parrot's cage here just for the sake of the demo, really. And yeah, I'm also deciding how I'm still going to lay out and change this load shedding stuff here. The media speaker things are things like Google Home speakers, the TV, that sort of thing. You can turn them basically on or stop them playing. You can adjust volume. And it'll also show you here what is playing, uh, you know, by often media uh, mp3 images I think or something like that it shows you sort of what's playing but they're also used to speak to 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 give notifications where is Donny? yes well that is just something for my wife to see where my iPhone actually is you know if I'm moving around or actually doing things no she doesn't stalk me really it's me that put it up but uh, just to give you an idea that's something you can do so whatever the device is whether it's an iPhone or iPad an Android phone Whatever's got device capabilities and integration, you can display it or five of them or whatever on the map. So that was just one idea. On the network, I've clustered some of these together, but I've got speed test running here. So it's showing me the current or the last measured download speed and whether it's in, again, I've defined these myself, you know, whether it's green, red, or so on. Um, speed test, ping. Add guard I'm running at home. I just keep an eye on how it's responding response-wise, if it's running slow or fast. And of course, I can turn it on and off over here and check that it is actually on. I also monitor through uptime robot integration. I'm measuring a couple of my key websites. Are they up or down? And then I also just see here at a glance, my VPS server in the cloud, what's its RAM, how much... The key things I like to keep an eye on are memory because the fuller memory gets, that usually tends to slow the machine down and then I might need just to go and attend to it. And the same thing for the home server. Here's an example of a mini graph where it actually plots everything for you as well over time with a couple of stats. So those are all things you can sort of turn on and off really. Uh, ham radio, I am just tracking a APRS beacon specifically so I can just check that it actually is up. You click on it, you can get a bit more info. This is actually a Sonoff switch. 
that controls all my ham radios. So it also measures, for example, the en current energy level of the radio. And I can also turn it on and off if I want to turn all my radios off for any reason. But you get a whole bunch of stats off the Sonoff switch. So this is an integration. Again, this is actually using MQTT to read this information from the device. So it updates every five or so seconds. Just about everything that you see on the dashboard as well, you can also click on it. And you will get a little graph usually, but something that's being measured, showing you whatever it is, rainfall, uh, power use in this case, and so on as well. So that's usually quite interesting as well. The last one that I've done so far is solar. And this is one that's been most interesting to me because I've interfaced it with not only my Victron inverter and solar charge controller, but also the balance cell uh, lithium ion battery that I've got. All of these have got, Victron actually comes with both Modbus as well as MQTT built into it as protocols. I decided to go for Modbus because it was a lot simpler to actually just get going with. Um, I wouldn't say MQTT is that complicated, but for me it was just simpler to get going with a Modbus. So I'm showing things like the live inverter AC load. And again, I've defined all these critical levels that I want to keep an eye on. Uh, what is the current battery charge? Is there any inverter solar energy going in at the moment and how much? I've adjusted it for max there. So that, that green at the right will be the max that my solar panels can produce. I'm pulling certain things out of the battery itself. Things like its voltage, its current and the solar battery health. Unfortunately, balance cell doesn't share everything. So although there is a register for number of cycles, battery cycle, charge cycles used, it seems to be that's not actually producing or providing the information. They seem to have blanked that out. Then I'm also just looking at net energy going out of the battery or going into the battery. So it shows me how much charge it's got or discharge is happening at the moment. I'm also reading the battery temperature. And that's also been adjusted for, you can see red on both sides. And this is basically essentially the cutoff levels at the left and on the right hand side here. Uh, this is a weather integration with a weather service. So it's just looking at the cloud coverage because this is just key for me to have a look at for the state of charge for the batteries. You know, do I let my batteries run super low? Do I, need to, do I need to keep them a little bit higher up? And I can just check what today's cloud level was. Tomorrow is going to be 24%, but a little bit worse. And what is the forecast? Partly cloudy. I've got again from the effigy sensor on the grid power. There again is the cost. And there's also the amount of grid power we're currently drawing from the grid. I should just say that this is a bit higher than it actually is. That thing device is overreading, and I think it's because I've got a bunch of wires in there, and I think it's picking up a little bit of stray power from some of the adjacent wires. This is the Victron's VE bus state, where it says to you, is it bulk charging, discharging? Has it got an error? Is it in float level? I can't remember the others now. There's about nine or 10 or 11 different codes. What I've done here is I've interpreted the codes and changed them into a, you know plain English descriptions. And I've done the same here for things like grid status, battery status, solar charger, AC overload. These are alarms. And these icons will all change as well, depending on the status, and they'll change color. So they'll go red and they'll change to something else. Yeah, these are also just mini graphs showing the solar stats. I'll come back to this one just now. The This, what you're seeing over here, is actually the web interface for the Victron color control GX device. So this is what I've actually got on the kitchen wall. So this is literally a what I've embedded here is a web view. So this is not what you're seeing here is really what the Victron system itself displays. And I want to show you just now how that works with the charge state. So let me just quickly open this here to show you sort of how I'm doing some of this. You go to edit dashboard and I open this, this item. You'll see I'm using a custom button card. That's the sort of the layout, type of layout on the card that you're seeing here at the moment. That's the entity is the sensor. So it's the VE bus state sensor. And you can, if you go back, you'll see it does sort of give you an idea as you're typing what, what matches the name that you're busy typing. Let's take a make sure you don't make mistakes. Uh, what icon I'm using. But the interesting part is the state. 
So the state is the value from the sensor, the VE bus. And you'll see if it state matches a zero, then I've said give it a label of off. If it matches a one, give it a label saying low power. If it's got a label of say three, okay, I'll put an if then statement here because Victron uses three both for discharge and for bulk charge. So what I've actually said here really is if the battery power sensor, that one that showed the charge discharge, if it's in a negative state, or if it's in a positive state, then show bulk charge. If it's not, then show discharge. It's basically what I've put there. Um, but if it's a five, then show float storage. So it's really that, I know it can look a little bit complicated, but once you get the hang of the fact that it's a matching value, um, give it a color. Doing RGB, you could also say color red or green, but you can get more control with RGB color codes. And things like the icon and so on, you can get the hang of it fairly quickly, but this is really customizing it, just making it a little bit more yours. You don't necessarily need all of this to start with. So, you know, don't be put off by it. And the same goes for the others. So let me just come back to this. The, the thing that I want to show here really of interest, this was an integration now with the solar system that these are reading things like the state at the moment. The ESS state at the moment for the MultiPlus unit is optimized with battery life. And I'm reading over here the current battery minimum state of charge. That's basically how low the battery goes and it stops there and, and goes back to grid power. Unless the grid, there is no grid power and there's no solar energy, then obviously it carries on discharging the battery. But that's quite a key thing for me to keep an eye on and how much I'm going to use of the battery basically on a daily basis. So I just want to go into, I can also interact through this, which is quite nice. So what you're reading over here is literally what's on the Victron system here. And you'll see it is showing there, it's got a minimum state of charge, unless grid fails, of 40%. Over here, on this entity card, I'm reading from there. So in other words, this is reading what's on the Victron system. And you can see both are agreeing it is 40%. Underneath it, I've got a little slider over here. Now, this was designed, it's you basically under helpers, you can define a whole lot of different inputs to like prompt for a text input. You can prompt for a drop down menu, or another thing you can prompt for is a slider control like this over here. I've chosen a slider control, and it's all graphically done. There's no coding required for this part, really. One thing that I did do is I didn't want somebody to click on this by mistake and readjust the battery. So you'll see it's got a little lock symbol as well. That's a confirmation piece of confirmation code I've put in really for the cards. So if you click on it, it's going to ask you up the top here, are you sure you want to adjust the state of charge? And obviously, if you do nothing, you'll cancel. It's just going to go back. Uh, you could ask for a PIN number or a password as well if it's something really sensitive. But what I just want to show you here was that if I adjust it now here in Home Assistant, it actually is updating and controlling here on the Victron system. So I'm going to change this to 45 and then watch over here. You'll see that changes to 45. And once it has, this will update over here because it's pulling back from the Victron system. It's reading and confirming what the battery charge is. So let's just go there and say, yes, OK. And I'll adjust the slider to there, 45. Let go. And you'll see it's already updated on the Victron system. And a few seconds later, it would have also updated over here. So that was the one half of an automation I needed to do. Change it in Home Assistant and write it back to Victron and actually change the Victron solar system value. Certain of those registers are writable. Not all of them. A lot of them are read only, but this is one of those writable ones you can adjust. Then the other half that took another day for me to work out was if I go and change it on the Victron side, Obviously, it'll update here because it's just reading it. But I also want my slider to read now that it's changed, say, to 40%. So you can see me do it here on the Victron system. I'll double click over there. Uh, I can click minus here, and that 45 will change to 40. And if I hit Enter, watch at the bottom in the middle there, Enter. I've programmed it, and shortly, there we go. They're both updated as well. So it's, I've given about a five second polling and that's why it takes a few seconds. So they basically are working in sync. And you can do this now for various of the other writable registers as well um, on the Victron system. And remember, this is Modbus. So whatever re works with Modbus, if it's got things like a slave device and 
address registers, you can basically do the same thing for whatever it really is. And this could have been, if the battery was allowing me to change things or the charge control, I could have done the same using Modbus interface as well. So um, yeah, that's really it. And then just to show again, or just to explain here as well, these are gauges, obviously, that you're seeing here. There are graph cards like this one over here. And these typically are button cards. So I don't think these have got any interaction. What they'll just show is some history for you. And things like yield, if you click on that, you're going to get a graph showing you, you know, various further information. You can define also single click actions and long hold press actions as well. So there's quite a lot of things you can do to customize this further. These can be split up into individual little buttons with proper button looking things that you can click on. It'll then change color and so on as well, depending on what you want. So like the sky's the limit, you know, you can customize this really to your heart's content. Okay, but the other thing that I really want to talk about is the integration. So you have got the built-in integrations that will show you what this thing will connect to, you know, with a click or two of, of just dropping the integration in there. There's built-in, and then there's this over here, the Home Assistant community store, which is all the third-party stuff by developers and people like you and me that have actually shared their stuff as well. So let's just first look at the inbuilt one under settings and you go to devices. These are obviously the ones that you'll see that I've already got. And remember I spoke about things like effigy, for example, is a device. There's one effigy device. I could have had some over here like the weather app. I've got two devices. Uh, Reolink camera has got three different cameras. So there's three devices there. These are services. So on Uptime Robot, I've got 10 services that I'm watching or websites. Google Cast, you saw I've got four speakers in the house. So there is four devices. And if I had to take, say, Effigy and I can click on the entities, you'll see there are the entities. In many cases, you'll see some data. Well, I'll actually show where the data is. It's under the Dev Developer Tools. But these are the different things that I talked about that you can measure or get it to respond on. But let's say and have a look. You go to Add Integration. And you can type in here quickly to search if you want to. But if you go down, you'll see weather, add guard, home. And I just want to go through it a little bit because it gives you a pretty good idea. There's ambient weather station, Apple Cloud, Asus routers. And for example, I've got an automation set up on my router at the moment. One of them is that if a device like my voice over IP phone goes missing or goes offline, it means the battery's gone flat and then it'll notify me. So, you know, there's all sorts of little things like that that you can actually do. So if you've got any of these sort of devices, these are already come in built in, ready to go. You can drop them in and make use of them. Uh, that's your SSL certificates over there, Cloudflare integration. There's the city of Cape Town load shedding. Coronavirus. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly with just short pauses. So I think if you want to, you know, stop, then just pause the video. But it gives a good idea of like the, the breadth. Oh, I've done a previous video where I talked about glances. That's all that performance management dashboard stuff. It's not got every single thing, but it's got quite a lot of things you can monitor. And again, you can trigger things. Like I said, if your server's memory is too high or if CPU usage or a container has gone dead, uh, you know, has died or something like that, you can get it to notify you as well. I think the power really in Home Assistant, there's IF, Triple T. The power really is in the automation, quite honestly. It's all the rules you can set up for it to do things. If you're not interested in this part, you know, just skip past the integrations. Um, I just like to give an idea because not many people have, say, installed it or you're wondering if you should install it. Then, you know, there's IP cameras, obviously, as well. There's MQTT to get that sort of functionality. I won't go through all the community ones, but I will give you a quick sort of preview of a couple. There's open garage for garage doors.
There's tons of stuff. There's ring doorbell. Shelly as well. Slack. I know there's Tesla devices as well. Steam. That's that sun card actually that you saw earlier for the sunrise, sunset stuff. Taz motor. That is the sun off flashed switches, uh, which I'm using. Tesla power walls, wall connectors, tile as well. Uptime robot for monitoring websites. So there's some of those are services as well. It's not just hardware devices. Ways travel time. Xbox. Okay, there you go. So those are the built-ins. So if you want to also get more detail, you can always just click on something like Xbox and it'll open up with additional information on how to install it. Oh dear, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted at all. Uh, so examples here are you can get more information say uh, maybe add guard home yeah it's going to ask you you just basically put your IP address your port number if you've got a username password and it'll basically then bring up and integrate the service so it's as easy as configuring you know just you just got to give the home address of your router and it'll prompt you for login and other details. So no coding for some of these things required. You just, as I said, put the information that's prompted in and it'll get you going. On the So the community service is not installed by default. You've got to add this afterwards. And I'm not going to show how there's lots of videos showing how to do it. But it also offers additional integrations, front end gauges and cards and that sort of thing and you can add over here additional they've got a lot of shared automation that you can install that are ready to use with the various devices but obviously you must have those devices but on the integration side again if you add it there's son of land specifically and there's a lot more sort of interesting items in here really web rtc cameras and you know, various other things, sometimes that have got more additional powerful features than the built-in ones as well. Google Home, Samsung TV, Tesla, some of these are EV charging vehicles, that sort of thing. So all sorts of stuff that you can monitor here. So yeah, okay, that's pretty well much. I don't want to go too much detail into that. What I just want to show now was Something around the cards, I did show just now, you know, what a card actually looks like, but I just want to show you that if you have any sort of errors or, or mistakes in it, like say this card one over here, this gauge, all you're going to now put is, if you want to define your minimum, your maximum, you put the number in there for the, for the gauge. You can give it a custom name and if you don't want percentage there you could type in you know if it's watts or whatever the case is but this does default and it's already defined as percentage you can put in here wherever you want each color to start obviously if three colors is not enough you can go here to things like code editor and you can start putting additional information there's a lot of help for each one of these types of cards and so on how you can expand it further but also it gives you an idea of what an error is. Like say, for example, if I typed true wrong, it's going to say there, uh, well, it's not supported. It will normally also tell you there we support Boolean, but received. So in other words, Boolean means it should be a true and false. You know, there's a mistake. There's an error there. It's not supported. Um, if here, for example, I was to put, uh, well, there you can already see how it changes. You know, if you put 34 or whatever the case is. But if I put something like that in, oh, I'm actually not. Oh, yes, I'm in the visual editor, sorry. But, you know, for example, there's an error. It's going to point me now there to, it says actually 6, line 6. But, okay, it is 5, but it's detected the error in that area over there. So just keep an eye on what these things actually are saying here. And, 
you know, you'll see as well, I think it's obviously expecting a number, not a string. Oh, it's actually interpreted that anyway without a problem. That's interesting. It's cleverer than I thought. But that's one sort of way. It does give you quite a bit of diagnosis and assistance here if you do make any errors. And then the other thing you'll also find is, let me just not save that. Let me just open it again. I go back to code editor. Things like indenting is very important. An indented line means it's performing something in relation to the line above it. So if the indenting is wrong, it throws everything out. But you'll see it does say a bad indentation of a mapping entity line 3. So you can go look there and say, well, okay, does it need to be there? No, it doesn't. Go back. Ah, oh, there we go. It's working now. So indentation is quite important, as is things like, you know, space. It's going to now give you some other error. It's not interpreting something correctly there. So that's sort of one way. I'll show another way just now how to fix something up. But the other thing I want to talk about really also was automations. The settings here, and you can go to automations and scenes. So I've got a couple of automations already set up, and this is where you want to build up your powerful stuff. So I've got one here for when Dani leaves Canal Walk, then it's going to notify my wife if the TV's been turned off. Here's the one I talked about. Say it started raining, and the ones that I showed you just now with the Victron system, I had ones to set the slider for the minimum state of charge, or whenever, you know, if it, it responds to it being changed elsewhere. And this one over here, it writes the minimum state of charge if I've adjusted the slider. And this is the one I was talking about if the voice of IP phone is offline. So they pretty, they're fairly simple. They're not too difficult. If you go to edit, you give it a description over here. You can talk about what it does. Um, does it fire off once on its own? Uh, does it cue it if there's multiple ones? If a second one comes in, must it restart and just ignore the one it's currently busy with? Or does it run them in parallel? That's sort of, in essence, normally going to run with a single one. And it's got a few assistant things here to help you debug and check it. And then things like a trigger. So what triggers this automation to actually happen? Often it's going to be the state of something changing. So it's monitoring a lot of things. Has a device gone missing, for example, then the state will change from present to missing or an alarm that was off or suddenly become on those are types of triggers to trigger the automation and to get it working in this case i'm monitoring a device and which device is it well it's actually my not a very good description but it's actually my weather station and watch which part of it am i actually measuring while well, i'm measuring the hourly rain rate value and if it changes then it's going to trigger this and i've basically said if it triggers from above zero look most of the day if the sun is shining and it's not raining it's a zero if it now suddenly changes 0 0.1 0 0.2 or whatever then it triggers this event and the conditions you can set is, my wife complained because she doesn't want it telling her it's raining at night. What's the point? We don't have washing on the line at night. So I basically said is on condition that the condition sun is before sunset and it's after sunrise. In other words, during the day. And you can add more conditions if you want. Then what action are you going to do? I'm going to play media. Which device is it going to go to? Well, I'm going to play it to the lounge speaker. And... It does a plain, this is what it says. Hey, it just started to rain just now. Or you could change it to whatever you want. This, interestingly enough, creates an MP3 file in your config file. If you go to your config directory, you could find that MP3 file. You could replace it with a recording of your own voice if you want to, to give it a more personalized feel as well. So there's another idea for you. The other thing I want to change, just show you briefly was these where I got stuck. These automations I spoke about earlier on with the Victron system. That was all fairly simple stuff I've talked about. But with writing to a register, there's a function that you call. And again, like you can crib my code really for this. But it's a Modbus write register. So it's going to write to this address register 2901. The slave is just which Victron device it actually is on the background. And that's the name of my, my Modbus service it writes this value this value i spent four hours trying to sort out and i couldn't get this right i know it looks very simple but does it have curly brackets does it need one does it need two does it need to be encased in a string does it need to be an integer value did it have to be multiplied by 10 
So the way to troubleshoot this, there's two suggestions I've got. One is start off, first of all, simple. Chunk your stuff up if you've got to write registers. Just put the value of 40 in there as a test amount, for example, and make sure that it writes and that part works. And once you know that works, then start worrying about how you go and get the value. Because really all this value is doing is it's saying, go look at input number, multi plus minimum state of charge. That actually is the slider. So if the slider moves from 40 to 45, it's calling it there, but this is a state change. Convert it to an integer and times it by 10. The reason is because what writes back to Victron is not 40, it's 400. It's just the, in other words, 40.0, but you've just got to multiply by 10. So you've got to put it into a little calculation like this. But like I said, to troubleshoot and start, before you worry about this, put 40 in. Once that works, then start worrying about your calculation. Now, the trick is to troubleshoot this. One way is, yes, if you go back here, you can sort of run it as debug, and it'll give you some idea of what the error is. But the other is you go here to Development Tools and go to Template. You can just delete all that and paste your code in. Oops, where's my code gone? It's got, it's gone and put, uh, I think, I don't know if it, there we go. Put your code in there. And what it'll do is now in live, it's going to be executing whatever the statement is. And you'll see, yes, it's pulling back 40.0 or 400 is the live value. Oh, sorry. Remember it is 40. It's been multiplied by 10. That's why if you take, if you take the 10 out and make it one, you'll see it's 40. So you can fix things here as you need to. You can convert it to float. You could even change this sensor value if you wanted to get another value from something else. You could type it in here, check that you've got the right value over there and that it's formatted, say, as a, in inverted commas, you know, as a string or a number or whatever it needs to be. So use this to help you debug, you know, any problems or issues you've got with your code, especially when it's a value statement that you've got to reduce it from sensors back to a value or something. You can build this up as you need to. And again, if there's mistakes, you know, it's going to say to you, hang on, uh, there's a template, a, t a syntax error, there's an expected closing bracket. You know where to go look and what you need to do. Hang on, extra bracket. Yes, okay, let me put that in. You know, if you've left that out by mistake, you can see, look what's happened there. There's something missing. So you can put it back in. So use this as well, I think, to... To work. I'm not going to go into too much else, but what is quite interesting is to look at this under developer tools, look at the states because it, it tells you what is the actual sensor you're looking at. Well, I'm looking at the shed camera. That's the that's a binary sensor for motion detection on my camera. In other words, is there any motion? No, there isn't. It's an off state at the moment. So it gives you an idea of what the value is. So it's probably going to be an off and on because it's a binary. If you look down further, we can just go down. Yeah, some of these have got values. So things like, hmm, that's drive, space, the glances, stats, CPU load. At the moment for my Open Media Vault server, CPU load is 0.64. And it's a measurement you can see there as well. Temperature, 53 degrees. So this is just where you can go and find out what your data actually looks like. And if you were to change things like on the solar system, you could just watch here and you could look at the live or the raw sort of data and get an idea of what the sensor name is. Is that the data you're looking for? Is it in gigabytes? Yeah, what sort of format is it? Uh, let me just see, is it kilowatt hours? Is it voltage? And there you can see the voltage of my switch for the ham radios. Status is 100. Uh, what else? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of information. So, you know, there you go. So the next thing I just wanna talk about really is that Modbus face with the Victron Solar System. So this part is going to be of interest for any Victron Solar Energy System users or anybody that's interested sort of in Modbus itself. So just to show you what I'm talking about there, if I just open the YAML file, so this, I've just created a little separate one called modbus.yaml. It links to the main config files. It calls this file. What I've just noted up at the top here is 
if you look at your Victron CCGX, because the important part is when you're working with Modbus, it has what it calls a slave identity, okay? And that is the device. In other words, is it the MultiPlus unit? Is it the Smart Charge Controller unit? Is it the battery? Or it could be also any other type of device, even if it's not Victron. So there's always a slave identity ID. In the terms of Victron, they've got a, I'll just show you the page next though. I don't want to keep jumping around, but they've got a page that sort of helps summarize some of their stuff. But also on the color of the CCGX device, there is a place you can go to to see the actual devices that are connected with the ID. So that is where you will find those numbers. And especially batteries, for example, can be unique to whatever battery you're using. If you're using a Victron Smart small solar charge it probably is going to be 247 the multi plus units some of them are going to be 246 but there might be something else and then the generic victron energy system usually is 100 or zero and for clarity people just use 100 to address it so when you're going to write to one of these registers or read from the registers you're going to say what is the device it's slave id 100 and then which is the actual register? So each register is going to be something different, like a voltage, uh, a degree centigrade, an amp hour, a kilowatt hour, whatever the case is. So here's an example of a register or a sensor, they call it. So I've given it a name, a sort of an easy English name to refer to, and it'll, I've called it battery SOC for state of charge. I've told it what is the unit of measure, it's percentage. Its scale is one to one. In other words, what I'm reading here and I'm writing back is exactly the same value. You see here below is 0 0.1 because again, like that early other state of charge control, you had to sometimes adjust the scale factor. Yeah, sometimes you've got to adjust it. The precision is, does it have any positions after the decimal point. Does it have to have a point 0.1? With a precision of 0, no it doesn't. It's just a round integer number. The precision of 1 is going to be, it, yes, it's going to show 40.1 or 40.2. And then, as I said, that address register is the thing that can be a little bit difficult. You've got to figure out what the address register is. So I'm just going to show you what the file, actually, the config file looks like. So whatever it is, that is the device 246 and address 34. So let's have a look here. The Victron page, and these will, I'll provide all these links, but they tell you here how to go and find that identity, the slave ID, on your device. They give you an idea of which range registers probably is related to which type of device. They've sort of tried to standardize that to a certain degree because there's a little bit of trial and error involved getting the specifically correct register here. Now, what I've discovered here, which could help a little bit, is in Linux anyway, there is a app that you can install or a, a, a what do you call it? A yeah, an application you can install called MB Poll, and that'll work on Ubuntu, Arch Linux, whatever. MB Poll will poll a Modbus register. Well, there's a couple more things you can do with it, but let's keep it simple. I'm just doing one register. What the syntax of a line looks like here is the dash A is the slave ID of the device. In other words, this I'm looking at now is the main Victron service. And then the dash R is the register or the address, 841. I'll come back to that just now. Dash C, I think if I remember correctly, was it, how many registers is pulled back? Because you could pull back five registers at a time here if you wanted to. And then the last part is the IP address of where it's going to find the Modbus service running. And in this case, that's the internal IP address or the LAN address of my Victron solar system. One little quirk here is that this, in fact, is actual address register 840, not 41. For some reason, I don't know, it does a minus one. I think it's at like that thing where you start counting at zero and not counting at one. So just bear that in mind. So if I now execute that, you'll see it will start reading that register 840 from device 100. In this case, it's not a changing uh, register. So you'll see it is, I think this is a 52.2. I think this is voltage. So what will happen is, this is why I had to adjust it to a scale of 0.1 to make it, take it from 522 to 52.1. And obviously a precision of zero will lose the two over there. So that's the easy way. And then like I said, you can, 
experiment and test here until you get to the right register that you're actually looking for. It will just confirm for you, you know, that's one way of probing the Modbus interface as well and testing the registers manually yourself. Vitron does actually give you, you'll see here they talk about an Excel spreadsheet that you can get and they will email it to you in, a, in an automated fashion. This is what the spreadsheet looks like. And they have got some unit ID mappings here. But yeah, it's better to go off your CCGS device, quite honestly, because it hasn't got all your odd batteries and other things that you, you might have. But this list of the addresses here, this is what's of interest. So we were looking at 841, 840, give or take. There you'll see a battery voltage for the system. It's address 840. That is the numeric type that it actually is, an integer. It's a scale factor of 10. That's why I said, remember, you didn't see 52. You saw 522 there, or 520. That's its range. And the other important thing to look at is this one, whether it's a readable or a writable. So you can't write this. It's a read-only register, obviously. And then this, it gives you other useful information. So for example, like the active input source, what you're going to get back is a zero. It means unknown. One means it's grid. Two means it's getting from generator. Three is shore power. 240 is not connected. So that's where you might want to have a little value statement or an if-then statement to put that into plain English. And if you go down here, you'll see a couple of registers are right. So you could, you could change this switch here. You could read it if you wanted to, to see if it's in charger-only mode, inverter-only mode, on or off. But because it's writable, you could write that Modbus register from your home assistant and switch it on or switch it off or switch it to, to inverter only. Or you could automate that through an automation as well. Uh, so yeah, there's quite a few that are, are and this is how you'll find out sort of what registers there are. And then I said, use something like that prober to go and check which slave device, you know, it actually is. Start with reads, don't go write. Read first and see what you're dealing with before you go write stuff. So now you also know if you've got that MB poll, you could actually from the command line execute that. I could execute that and uh, probably do a write as well, maybe. Not actually sure. But anyway, that's the spreadsheet that you get from Victron. And that really is pretty well much it on the Victron side. I think to make further sense of it really is, as I said, the next part really was this GitHub project page I've created. And yes, the, the link will be below. But I did this really to share the config files. But I've also just given a bit of a description. I've said sort of some of the key stuff that I've already implemented on my particular dashboard. Some of the automations that I have got running so far. I've given some description of what the files are above, where to find them and what they're about. I've also included my Docker Compose file to spin up the container for Home Assistant. My wish list I'm still working on for my to-dos, and I've credited a couple of the sources that I've learned quite a bit from, you know, various videos and Victron information that assisted me as well. Basically up here is there's inside Docker is the Compose file. And under HA configs, I've put the sort of the key files. The one just to note is the Lovelace one. These are in the config as they named. They are in the config directory that you'll have for Home Assistant, however you've installed it. The Lovelace one is a level or two below. It you can't really just take this and use it, but if you open it, you'll see it's the code for all those cards and gauges. So if you're trying to figure out like, wow, how, how did he get that one or two things to display in that particular manner? You could actually just go down here and you could cut the relevant part out. So if you go to, it's normally the start of a card. It's a horizontal stack. It's defined by, it's got a couple of cards and then there's a card called this one. Well, I shouldn't say it's called, sorry, there's one card which is a custom button. There's normally a name. Next stage, start. There we go. Next stage, start. The other card, oh, sorry, that's not the card name. It's probably better to look at the entity then. It's the sensor for load shedding stage. This one is the load shedding active, yes or no, true or false over there. And you'll see that's where I've put in that state with false, true. So you could sort of take that code and go on work on that to make yours match that. And there will be a couple, like the slider code will be in here as well. 
you just got to, I'm not going to go through all of it in, in heavy detail, really, but just to give you an idea of what's inside that Lovelace one. So the Lovelace one, just remember, it's not a good idea to paste that as is into yours. It's going to change your entire dashboard, and this is linked to mine. So rather just open it and work with, you know, really what's inside it. But yeah, that's really it. And um, yeah, I hope it was of some interest, really. But go through those integrations a little bit. It gives you an idea of sort of what Home Assistant can do. Start with one, I think, and try and get that right. You know, I started with 20 and I just got bogged down with, because as I'm trying to fix one thing, I'm seeing another thing and I'm hopping all over the place. So my advice is, you know, if you're new to it, start with one or two things. Just get them going nicely and then build on from there and then go back and start customizing it, you know, even further. And then remember, really, the power for Home Assistant is in the automations, is setting up those automations. Again, start with one do them the fun ones if you want to start with and you know get to the more serious writing registers and and changing your solar system and so on a bit later on but i think you can have tremendous fun with it i think home assistant is certainly one of those things you don't just start and finish with it you start with it and then you go through phases 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 of further development and more things and as you get newer devices and things in the house or at work or whatever the case is you've also got a lot more to play with and to take further there's a lot of community forums the guys are very very helpful online as well so if you get stuck you know post something there i'm not necessarily going to be an expert on what you've got but if it's something that i've talked about here or it's victron solar system you know i can maybe help with something around that but yeah that's really it so i hope that was of interest then to some of you at least and if you're still here at this part of the video then thanks very much for watching and I'm not sure when the next video is going to be, so I'd suggest possibly to subscribe if you want to keep up with my videos. I only post every week or two, three weeks, sometimes one month apart. And I've got no idea at this stage what the next video is going to be about. It'll be whatever gets me interested and excited about something. So, yeah, keep well and keep safe out there, and I'll see you then in the next video.